Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. I'm your host, Nicole, and this podcast is your guide to start creating a lifestyle by design. From entrepreneurship, money and finance, tax optimization and residencies, and everything in between, this show highlights the nuances of a true global citizen lifestyle. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the show. And this episode you're about to listen to is such a treat. I sit down with Elliot Rosenberg from Hack My Honeymoon. He really dives into the details of travel hacking and gaining additional points and miles that, of course, you can use for travel. Now, absolutely anybody can get into the U.S. system in terms of credit and banking, It is easier for some citizens of certain countries over others, but we do help our clients in that if you are interested in learning more on how to get into the U.S. system so that you can take advantage of everything that Elliot shares in this episode and making money, earning points and miles through absolutely everything that you purchase, not only in the U.S., but all over the globe. So Elliot really dives into the details of this, where to get started, who he sees is the best market to really have access to these very beneficial cards and getting started point hacking. Elliot has also been a global citizen for over a decade now, and he's lived in India for almost a full decade. So he shares his experience, what to do, where to be, and of course, cost of living from the comparisons that he has seen over his time in India. This is such a great episode, so let's dive right into it. Elliot, welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. Today's conversation, I'm very much so looking forward to, and it's going to be very applicable to absolutely every single person who is listening to this podcast right now. We're going to be diving into all things travel, point hacking and miles and you focus specifically on honeymoons and getting points and miles for honeymoons. So please share with us a little bit of an introduction about what you do, who you are, where you started and how you got to where you are today. Sure. I'm Elliot Rosenberg, founder of Hack My Honeymoon and I have been in the travel space either as an entrepreneur or as a traveler for over a decade, particularly using the beautiful world of points and miles. And what we do at Hack My Honeymoon is we help engaged couples to get luxury honeymoon flights and hotels for pennies on the dollar, usually around 80 to 90% less than what they would otherwise pay using points from airlines, hotels, credit cards, and other kinds of travel hacks. And we specifically work with engaged couples because of the fact that they have so much money that they're generally spending on their their weddings. And that can go toward generating a lot of points and miles for the honeymoon that they're going to take after the wedding. But that being said, we don't exclusively work with Uh, engaged couples and business owners, individuals, families who just want to take really cool trips and spend pennies on the dollar, we'll gladly work with them. Interesting. Okay, so let's dive into this. And my first question is, it's interesting that you say you work with engaged couples because before the honeymoon comes the wedding. And so there's a big spend amount. Now, If you have a business, you're an entrepreneur, do you really have to have a high enough monthly spend in order to start playing this game, getting in on these cards and getting the rewards that would really reap enough benefits to have a pennies on the dollar flight and hotel stay? Sure. So I'll speak specifically for people uh, in the U.S. or even people who have access to the U.S. financial system but may not maybe expats like myself. Um, And I would say if you as an individual or a couple are spending one or $2,000 a month on expenses that can go on credit cards, and sometimes there are expenses that are coming out of your bank account uh, that could actually go on credit cards without really making you spend more. So if you're spending in that range, then 
you can get lots of really cool things uh, in terms of flights, hotels, other kinds of experiences using points and miles. But yes, the more that you spend personally and professionally as a business, small business owners are great if they have lots of lots of expenses that, that can go on credit cards without paying extra fees, then you can do far more and accomplish it more quickly. So you mentioned there the threshold, it sounds like one or 2000 per month. Is that typically a good starting point that you recommend? Like if you're spending less, doesn't really make sense. If you're spending minimum that, or of course more than it starts to make sense. So just at a high level, the way that we generally work or the, the main strategy that we, that we use is signing up for new credit cards, particularly travel credit cards that have really big welcome bonus offers. Like in the U S it might be something for, for like a personal card. They might say earn a hundred thousand points worth minimum thousand dollars in travel after spending $3,000 on your new card in the first three months, something like that. So if you're spending less than that, there are some personal, not business cards, but, but like personal cards that have spending amounts around $2,000 in three months. So I would say like, let's, let's take a thousand dollars as a, as a threshold. There are even cards out there that exist that, allow you to get a really big bonus after your first purchase. And that could be buying a cup of coffee and then just paying like an annual fee of about a hundred dollars. And then you've got a bonus that's worth minimum a thousand dollars in travel. So we'll just speak in general terms, say a thousand plus a month. I think that's a pretty attainable threshold yeah. for most people. So I find that very interesting. Yeah. Um, let's dive into some of the specifics. So how do you work with clients? Yeah. Are there certain cards that you're like, these are no brainers you should have regardless? Right. Like what do the specifics look like? So when we're working with our clients, we first of all, start off by trying to understand what are their travel goals without a goal in, a goal in mind. This might just end up being a waste of time, or you might end up just hoarding, accumulating a bunch of points that are going to have no value until you actually do something with them. So it's best to start off with some ideas of like what kind of experience you want to have, but at the same time, not be too rigid. So we'll try to see like, do you want to have a beach holiday? Do you want to go skiing? Do you want to take a safari? Do you want to explore cities in Europe or South America? And then we'll also try to see what, what kinds of spending do you have in the next six, 12 months, whether it's on your wedding or just your, your, everyday living expenses, things like dining, grocery, gas, uh, utilities, etc. And get a little background on your credit situation. You really need to have, say, average or above average credit for this to, to make sense. And of course, the, the bare minimum prerequisite that I should, I should say as a disclaimer before we move on is that if you are not financially responsible, and you are someone who gets a credit card and then decides to spend more money just because of that shiny piece of plastic, then please throw your phone out of the window right now or smash your laptop because this is too dangerous for you to listen to. So if you are going to end up paying interest or late fees uh, on cards or spend more than you otherwise would, then all of this just doesn't make sense from a, from a math perspective. Uh, so we get that out of the way in the, the first interaction. And then we uh, use that to craft a custom points earning strategy, particularly for a honeymoon, but it could really be for any kind of trip or series of trips that, that clients want to take. And, you know, with that, we're going to be talking about signing up for new credit cards. We're going to be talking about if you're planning a wedding, then earning points from your venue over and above what you'd get from just spending on a credit card or earning points from the wedding hotel room block uh, from your wedding guests staying at that hotel and then you getting a, a kickback in terms of points from the hotel from that, et cetera. We craft a, that custom strategy and then give that to you. And while you're earning the points over three, six, nine months, we will uh, be there to support you with any kinds of questions that you have. And finally, 
once it's time that you have you've accumulated the points we we check in again and we do all the research to build an itinerary where there's availability using these points for the maximum value and we'll book the the flights stays and maybe some experiences using your points at the end we we finish up with the fact that a lot of the a lot of these cards do have some uh annual membership fee that comes along with them that will usually then come due after the first year whether it was charged in the first year or not depends on the card but it's almost certainly going to come due uh 12 13 months after you opened that card and we we tie a bow on everything by by helping you to avoid paying that annual fee or reduce the annual fee while not having any negative impact on your credit. And so regarding what you just were speaking about at the the last part there, is there a way that you can almost negotiate that annual fee or negotiate Absolutely. not paying that annual fee? I've never yeah. heard that before. Yeah, actually uh, what people don't realize is that uh with banks or I just financial institutions in general, you might think that oh there are these massive institutions and why would they do anything custom or specific to me? It's not like a restaurant where I can get cheese on the side of my dish or something like that. But you can get all kinds of concessions from banks just by asking. So things like in case for whatever reason your your payment didn't hit on time and you get charged with a late fee, you can ask them to waive that fee. With annual fees, you can ask them to waive those fees or reduce them or they have in some cases, uh, retention offers where you just tell them once the fee has hit and you haven't paid it yet, I'm actually considering canceling this card. Don't say that you're ready to cancel it because then they might just cancel it. But say you're considering canceling the card. Not sure if you if, if I get enough value from it. And then oftentimes they will come back to you with a retention bonus offer, which can uh, be, you know, an excellent deal depending on how it's structured in terms of points, in terms of cash. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can get just by asking. And I'm sure you've seen, I'm sure you've seen it all. Um, okay. So I'm curious now, certain cards when you're having a wedding and a honeymoon, you're, you know that you are going to have probably some of the largest expenses coming up in your life. Do you usually right. recommend keeping those same cards afterward or do you see it not so beneficial if you're not having that insanely high spend for the next one to two years and then transferring or downgrading over to a different card? The only way this show grows is if you share the episodes you love and your key takeaways. If you've been loving this show, hit subscribe and leave a five-star review with your favorite takeaways. We appreciate you and let's get back into the episode. There are a few cards that do have great recurring benefits that even if you're not spending on those cards, it may be worthwhile to keep them. Things like uh, travel insurance, uh, various credits that they give you for everything from dining to flights to hotel stays, uh, as well as if they're their part or if they have partnerships with loyalty programs, then giving you like elite status benefits, say like. Uh, Hilton honors uh, diamond status, which is the top tier status that just comes from keeping that card. And that'll give you free suite upgrades, free breakfast, late checkout. And in some cases, it may be worthwhile to just keep paying that fee. For me, and I'd say most of our clients, 90% of the time, it's not going to be worthwhile to keep paying that fee. Uh, again, if you can negotiate reducing that fee or waiving it or getting a retention bonus, then yes, it might make sense to keep. But otherwise, the best option is generally going to be downgrading your card to one that doesn't have an annual fee if it's a personal card, because then that will maintain the credit history on, on your credit report, which is going to be helpful for building your credit score. And if you want to, say, uh, apply for a mortgage, and qualify for the lowest possible interest rate in terms on that mortgage, having that good credit score is going to be very helpful. So I'm going to ask a question that I know the audience is going to want to know, as do I as well. Sure. 
A lot of us listening, we use credit cards on the day-to-day wherever we are in the world, but the issue is foreign transaction fees, which can definitely add up when you Mm -hmm. have enough spend on the card. So in particular, are there any cards that you really recommend US-based that are great cards, but really are great and don't have that foreign transaction fee? Yeah. So if you are... In the American system, I can so I can talk about those cards. Generally, in the U.S., the travel cards, the ones that have like hundred plus dollar annual fees, will have waived foreign transaction fees. And on top of that, usually the exchange rates have negligible markup. So it's there's like no benefit to using cash or using uh, a card from the local country's financial system. So one of those cards that's nice is the Capital One Venture Rewards card. It has a $95 annual fee, but they give you 10,000 points every year that you pay the fee. And 10,000 points is worth minimum $100 in any kind of travel purchase that you can just wipe off with a statement credit on your on your account. So it's really like net $5 that they're paying you to keep the card. And there are no, um, no foreign transaction fees. And that card earns two points per dollar, which is effectively 2% cash back on every transaction that can be used toward travel purchases at a bare minimum. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that, that's good to note because... Those foreign transaction fees, they can definitely add up. Um, You mentioned there that the exchange rate is quite similar. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you're getting a card what exchange rate they're going to be charging you? Uh, So uh, there are different fees and rates that come into all this, but generally banks work with different uh, payment networks. And the main ones that we all know of are Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. American Express is one of the few that is both the issuer and the one that, in the sense that they're giving you the credit, but the transactions are riding on their merchant network. So all of those have their own uh, their own foreign exchange rates, and I have found that the actual rates generally are maybe 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3, max 0. 0.5 percent uh of a markup but it's like very close and just the points that you're earning from that spending is going to more than offset that even forgetting the sign up bonus on the card just regular spending on the card so it generally makes it's like a very obvious choice to to use that card and you'll end up netting um regardless of any small fee that there might be any small markup um so that's something that you can generally check online. You can see like what is the actual like spot rate for different currencies with different payment networks, Visa, MasterCard, and MX. So you mentioned a while back when you were speaking about needing a certain credit score mm-hmm. in order to really get into this game. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what that looks like? Yeah. In the US, I would say that you need to have like average or above average credit to take maximum advantage of this. So in numbers, that's usually like a 650 to 700 minimum score, which is, uh, does it, as long as you are paying all of your loans on time and keeping up with the minimum payment schedule and not like maxing out your credit lines, then you're probably going to have that score. And my last question before I definitely want to dive into some travel with you, sure. but my last question, are there any just no brainer cards that you see out there that you're like, this is just a good card to have? Mm-hmm. Yeah, The one that I just mentioned is, is great. If you're like thinking about having a card and keeping a card, if, if you are someone who lives in a country where you're spending a lot in cash a lot of merchants don't accept credit cards or don't accept foreign cards, which is a lot of, especially developing countries, but even parts of Europe, a lot of times credit cards aren't accepted. 
And in that case, you're withdrawing a lot of cash. So this actually is a recommendation for a debit card, a checking account, which is a Schwab investor checking account uh, gives you a debit card that allows you to withdraw from ATMs with no fees. And it reimburses all of the, the like fixed fees, usually like five to $10 per transaction that the local banks ATMs charge you. And as long as you are rejecting whatever exchange rate is being given to you by the ATM, the bank or the merchant, then it's going to default to the visa exchange rate. And that's a great way if you're traveling in a cash heavy country to avoid paying fees. But I would say if you were to just like have one debit card and one credit card, it'd be that Schwab investor checking debit card and that uh, Capital One Venture Rewards credit card, which is there are other cards that have the word venture in them. There's a Venture X, which may be not worthwhile for a lot of people listening. There's a Business Venture X that probably won't be worthwhile for a lot of people. So it's the Capital One Venture Rewards card for credit and Schwab investor checking debit card for just your your ATM withdrawals. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Really good information. Really interesting information for global citizens in general. But you have been in this game for a while, yeah. quite a while, and you've been traveling the world yeah. and living outside of your home country right. for quite a while. Yes. So I'd love to hear a little bit of a background sure. of, I believe you mentioned off air, it was almost a decade ago, yeah. where you have lived yeah. and where you are currently settled now. Yeah. And then let's dive into that. Yeah, I have lived outside of the U.S., for about 13 years as an adult. And I have, uh, the, the places that I've actually, I would say lived in and not just visited are Chile uh, for about a year. Uh, I lived in Brazil across a couple different stints for a total of two years. And uh, now I am in India and I've been in India for almost nine years now. That's so cool. Like I was saying to you off of air, India is a place I have not yet been. We lived in Turkey for a few years. So once we get back to that side of the world, I think we'll make our way over there. But um, India is a place where talking to a lot of nomadic friends, they either love it or they hate it. Yeah. So share a little bit about where you've lived in India yeah. and some of the experiences that you've had to obviously make you love it. You've been there for so long. Yeah. I lived the majority of the time. So when I first arrived in Mumbai, which is uh, one of the biggest cities and just an, a total and complete beautiful chaos. It's a all sensory overload and you have people living on top of each other. You have tons of traffic, construction, and many in many ways pretty bad infrastructure but if you're someone who seeks chaos and uh revels in that and enjoys just like mishmash of culture and still having like all of the say like cosmopolitan amenities of a world class city then mumbai is awesome uh but after getting married it it kind of just felt like the charms of the city had worn off. And especially post COVID, a lot of things changed in the city. And, you know, I think just, I had fallen out of love with it. Uh, and my wife and I wanted to escape that. So we moved to a place called Rishikesh, which is in the foothills of the Himalaya. I think it's famous among Westerners for being like the yoga capital of the world and also where the Beatles in the late 60s kind of uh, camped out with a uh, spiritual guru leader and lived in his ashram for many months. They have an ashram there called the Beatles ashram now uh, that's got all kinds of like Beatles uh iconography and stuff and we were there for about eight months and it was a great break from from Mumbai but I think we kind of overcorrected too much 
in terms of like going from urban to rural cosmopolitan to kind of like living in a semi village atmosphere. And we ended up leaving there and coming to where we are now, which is Goa, it, which is a state. It's a small state in India. A lot of people think it's a city, but if you were to drive from end to end, it'd be like four hours. And we, Goa is known as a beach tourist destination. It's a party destination. We're not really here for the, for the partying, but it, it, I think has some really underrated, underappreciated nature in terms of uh, like one of the highest biodiversity ecosystems in the mountains with all kinds of things of like tigers and birds and black panthers and snakes and monkeys. And then it has beautiful waterfalls, backwaters, and just, it was a, it was a former Portuguese colony uh, until, and it joined India like 15 years after the mo- the majority of India got independence from the British. So it has a very different, unique culture and attitude than the rest of India. We're really loving it here. I'm sure there's so much amazing history if you go to different parts of the country. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Um, so I'm curious, you mentioned about specific to Mumbai and I guess some of the bigger cities, a lot of expats, and mm-hmm. you'll know this as well as I will. When we go to a new city, we're really looking for a certain set of things. Like a lot of the time we don't want to live like the locals. There's certain areas I find in most cities that are more designated for these are kind of the places where the expats will live. Cost of living is a little bit higher. Maybe there's some more like food around because they're really catering that to the market of expats that are there. Do you find that there are certain pockets, I guess we're talking in Mumbai or any other major cities that you've been to in India, where there is a different set of living for foreigners, at at least initially when you first land in Mm -hmm. a country, I find it's easier to go to those places and then go from there. Yeah. And in Mumbai, there's a neighborhood called Bandra, which is where I spent most of the years that I lived there. Uh, And Bandra is kind of the Bollywood center uh, of Mumbai and uh, has like lots of healthy, bougie cafes and fancy restaurants and comedy clubs and bars and other events. But it's still really... Uh, has lots of different subcultures within a, not a very big neighborhood. And I'd say that ends up being kind of the center of gravity for most expats. Now, if you're, if you're kind of like someone who's working for a corporate and on like an international rotation, there's a good chance you'll be uh, on in a, you'll be working in an area called BKC. And staying close by to there, there's kind of some like adjacent residential pockets, but traffic in Mumbai sucks. And I'd say that'd be the main reason for living there because you want to be close to your office. But if you want to have like a more interesting, culturally vibrant existence, I'd recommend Bandra more so, especially if you're younger. There, There is sort of like the old historic part of Mumbai that gets expats, but I think it tends to skew, say, like 40, 50 plus aged expats, and kind of the center of gravity is moving away from that area, which is called Kolaba in in South Mumbai, and more toward Bandra and BKC these days. Gonna have to keep this um, this audio on file for whenever sure. I get there. I, I need to ask because I'm sure everyone is probably thinking this question in their mind as they're listening what is the average cost of living that you see in 2024 for an expat living in bandra let's say on bandra so bandra is the most expensive neighborhood in mumbai and probably india and the quality that you get well it depends like what what you're looking for but a lot of the construction or, or buildings in Bandra uh, can be kind of outdated and run down. 
despite being relatively very expensive, especially for Indians. But like if you were to get a decent two bedroom apartment in Bandra, you would be spending close to $1,500 a month, which for most Indians is just insane. Like $1,500 is probably the average Indian per capita income annually. So it's a relatively very expensive neighborhood. Um, and the rest of India is going to pale in comparison to that in terms of rents. Uh, so I'd say it in many ways kind of compares to the cost of living of like a smaller city in the U.S. in in that particular neighborhood. But then if we talk the rest of India, it's way cheaper. And what does that look like? I'm just very curious outside of Bandra, the rest of India on average. Like for, for cost of living? Yeah. So I can tell you I'm living in a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, it's, I think, about 1,000 square feet. It's maybe 10 years old. And we have a pool. We have a small gym. It's, like, very – there's, like, a very lush garden courtyard. We're next to uh, a river or backwaters. So it's, like, river plus ocean and we're paying about seven hundred dollars, seven hundred and fifty dollars a month in rent plus utilities. So, uh, by Indian standards, still expensive, but as compared to Bandra and Mumbai, like you know, less than half the price and better quality wow. of life. Yeah. And do you um, like the food in India? Yeah. I just cannot wait uh-huh. do you find i guess you've been there for a while mm-hmm. so i'm sure it's a different story but when you first got there yeah. was it just takeout restaurants all the time the food's delicious and now i'm curious do you cook more local foods because there's a lot of those ingredients i love indian food and there's so much variety that you get in india that you would not see in the average indian restaurant in the west and th- I think that blows a lot of people's minds who are used to like eating a very limited and kind of westernized version of Indian food outside of India. Uh, so there's a, just a wide diversity. And also, you know, you can have really fine dine Indian restaurants, which still by Western standards are not that expensive, like a fancy meal with alcohol would maybe cost hundred dollars for a couple but you know you've got incredible street food if you have the stomach for it that's you know you can easily spend less than a dollar for for a a street food meal and it'll be delicious but uh you may not want to just get straight out of the airport and dive into that you may need some like adjusting time i have i have like a, a a very hearty and battle tested stomach so i can handle pretty much anything i was gonna say did you have to go through that experience yourself where it just like was there was there a period of time and i hear for a lot of foreigners there is where the food is just just so different and maybe especially if you're eating street food i guess but did you have that kind of adjustment period of time as well i'm very lucky in the sense that i had also been trapped so i took with the with the power of points and miles, I backpacked to 17 countries in Asia over 15 months. So maybe microbially, I was introducing myself to somewhat similar strains along the way. Uh, So I didn't really have any adjustment in India that was required. And I also lived in, in South America for about three years. I lived in the biggest favela in Brazil for about a year and a half. And drinking tap water there, I think I'm set for life. Oh gosh, drinking tap water. Yeah. Well, this was a very interesting conversation. Thank you for coming on and of course sharing so much about your life in India and then also what you do in hack point hacking and getting miles. So very interesting conversation. Where can the listeners find you online? So the easiest place is our website, hackmyhoneymoon.com. And like I said, while we are focused on honeymoons, if you were already married or a single person, a business owner looking to get really cool travel experiences and pay pennies on the dollar, then we can still help you. And other than that, social media, 
My handle on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok is at E H R O S E N B E R G, E H Rosenberg. And I uh, pretty much post videos and hacks daily there. You've just listened to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. If anything from this episode resonated with you, I'd appreciate if you share this podcast on your socials. And of course, be sure to tag us at Work, Wealth, and Travel. And don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining us on this global citizen journey, and we'll see you in the next episode.